Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us. I'm disappointed that more of you didn't want to go and learn about metadata, but <laughs> I'll let the rest. Um, so, welcome to our paddle, pa panel on collaborations. Um, my name is Caroline Priday, and I'm co-head of the PUP European Office, which is based in Oxford, and which this year celebrates 25 years of existence and collaboration with our colleagues in Princeton and Beijing. Um, I'm also, as you may have gathered, one of the co-chairs of the Even Up group, from whom you've just heard, and didn't they do a fabulous job? Um, before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to give a quick shout out to Edinburgh for their fabulous hosting so far. And um, just to reiterate the wonderful collaboration we had with them on the early career buddy group, which um, Paula mentioned in her session. Um, and we very much hope to expand this to further presses next year. Um, while we're on shout outs, I'd also like to congratulate Bristol on their IPG Academic Publisher Award. <laughs> So, our panel today is Ali Shaw, CEO of Bristol University Press, who will give an overview of knowledge sharing and how we work together. Uh, then we have Emma Brennan, Editorial Director at Manchester, who will cover Open Up, a collaboration case study. And finally, Philippa Grand, Head of Publishing at LSE Press, who will be looking at it matters what stories make worlds, what worlds make stories. Open institutional publishing and new relationalities in scholarly communications. If that isn't a heading from a university press, I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with a quick outline of our discussion, and then each speaker will take about 10, 12 minutes, followed by time for Q&A. And if you haven't got any questions, you get to go early. Um, so, university presses differ from other publishers in our shared values. The aim to bring world-class scholarship, um, publish world-class scholarship, which brings with it challenges such as peer review, library budgets, institutions, and on occasion competing against more wealthy trade publishers. In preparing this panel, we considered what collaboration looks like across a range of areas and how everyone brings something to the table, regardless of size or scope. Larger presses may have the resources for dedicated positions in particular areas, um, equity, diversion, inclusion and belonging, or digital or sustainability, allowing them to share best practice while smaller presses can provide agility and clarity of thinking, achieving amazing things with small teams. We do also need to bear in mind that we are competitors and subject to the laws that apply in that area. Collaborative projects can have their challenges. Perhaps not everyone is on the same page or starting point or wanting the same outcome. That aside, collaboration can derive from something as simple as offering mutual support across your cohort when next steps may be unclear. And sometimes collaboration can just be about needing a good whinge over one of your shared problems, which I will shamelessly admit I cribbed from Ali. <laughs> I'll now hand over to Ali to kick us off. I think that last point is, uh, is very apt. <laughs> so I uh, keep saying I feel hopelessly unprepared for this talk, and uh, so, uh, but we'll give it a go. So um, oh, collaboration across presses, um, it's at the heart of what we do. It's, it's everything <laughs> that we do. So we collaborate within our presses, but we collaborate across our presses. And uh, I think what uh, was just being said uh, about uh, it doesn't matter whether your press is huge, it has been running for, you know, Oxford and Cambridge, what is it, five, 400, 500 years, you know, we're talking, through to um, 
I don't know, BUP is now seven years old. <laughs> it was, uh, so some of the, the much smaller and, and younger presses. Um, I think it doesn't matter also about the range of kind of governance models we have. We actually, we are, um, so we have wholly owned subsidiaries, we have companies that are um, completely independent. We have people, uh, companies just like ourselves that sit as a department within a, within a faculty, within a university. There's a huge range. But across all those things, um, somehow those barriers melt away when you start uh, talking about um, collaboration. So one of the things I was going to just uh, talk to you briefly about was um, something, well, it was a kind of, it's a bit of a personal story. So um, uh, I've been um, knocking around rather a long time. Um, I've been in, in uh, academic publishing for over 30 years and have started three imprints over my time. A tiny one when it was, um, that was just around research dissemination at the University of Bristol, focused on social policy. Then we set up Policy Press for 20 years, and then we set up Bristol University Press. And so they've, they've kind of grown in, in, um, in scope uh, and in numbers. So I've gone from uh, me and a secretary through to, I think we're over 60 people now, over that period of time. And so I suppose what that's allowed me to do is to think about collaboration at all those different points in the, in the scale. I mean, I know we're nowhere near, nowhere near Princeton, Oxford, Cambridge, but in terms of growth, you know, it's... Um, it's still quite a big one. And uh, so back, um, I don't know, maybe Anthony can tell me, but um, maybe 10 years ago when we were policy press and we were thinking about um, whether we really should do the, the full university press thing, we, whether, whether we should do Bristol University Press, um, I reached out to, um, the start of lots of collaboration, reached out to the um, chief execs of, of, of the, what, well, ended up being called the mid-sized five. So uh, similar kind of, uh, it was a bit of a joke, but it sort of stuck. So across, so Liverpool, Manchester, Edinburgh, uh, uh, Wales. And I just went and bravely, I thought at the time, went and spoke to everybody and said, OK, so how is it? What do you do? How do you do it? And trying to work out um, how a, uh, how a, I, how a university press operated within those different models. And we looked at governance issues, we looked at editorial boards, we looked at um, all sorts of different kinds of strategy. And those informal talks actually were obviously enlightening, totally enlightening for me because I was trying to work out where to go. But I hope um, uh, actually brought, started to bring together a bit of a collaboration between those presses. It could have been happening before I came along. I'm not taking any credit for it. But actually, for me, it was um, the start of what has been an incredibly fruitful collaboration across those presses. So um, from that point, we started meeting regularly. We, uh, uh, the, the, the group has been small and large. It's sometimes in, it's incredibly informal. Sometimes it's included European presses, US presses. Um, and it uh, sometimes has ha had quite formal stages where we've met several times a year and had an agenda, and sometimes it's just a chat on Zoom occasionally to see whether uh, the sales in the US are as dismal as ours, those kinds of things. <laughs> um, uh, but what it, I think what it, um, what it set up was a sense that collaboration between presses, who, as was, you know, we've just said, is, you know, we are competitors at the same time as being collaborators, and you have to really think about how to make that work. But the thing that I am so struck with in this industry, I, you know, is just how approachable, friendly, supportive, and willing to share this industry is. Um, again, a personal anecdote is going. My first, um, we heard earlier on about the IPG, the Independent Publishers Guild, um, who have quite a strong. Um, uh, uh, academic and professional arm to it and I went to my first IPG conference when I was you know I can't remember a gazillion years ago anyway um, I think that we'd published you know I don't know 30 books at this point it was we were tiny and um, John Skelton who uh, is long retired now but uh, ran Open University Press and it was a press that I greatly admired because it dealt with some of the social issues that I cared so passionately about and uh, they used to run a session which was basically kind of an ask me anything 
a bit Christy, um, ask me anything session and you'd get paired with somebody else who could, who could answer it. And I was just setting up our first distribution deal in the UK. Um, felt like a big thing and so I put this. And John came forward and I couldn't believe that somebody who I was essentially emulating and trying to <laughs> essentially get into the market would be so open and sharing of everything he knew and, you know, about this area. Um, he ended up on our board. He's still a friend of mine a gazillion years later. So it just shows that these collaborations kind of work. But I suppose, again, it just emphasizes how those one-to-one -one connections actually are incredibly supportive across presses. And, uh, and we should never be afraid to, to kind of ask for that or speak to people. I mean, so back to the kind of the, 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 um, the university press um, mutual support helpline uh, that we set up. What then happened was um, we found that, uh, that people within our presses also wanted to talk to the other, the other presses. And so a kind of phase two came into, very informal again, phase two came in where the directors of the uh, operational teams and the marketing teams and the sales teams started meeting and again that got that got formalized and has been going on for, for many years and again those groups have been big and small and you know presses come and go and join but they're incredibly supportive and I think even and now there's even I think a, 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 almost a phase three where junior groups are, are emerging a, across those uh, across many of the university presses and topic-based groups, so like uh, coming around, uh, coming together over things like AI. Um, I think the, the, the kinds of things that we've talked about, you know, uh, as was said, you know, we obviously never share pricing discounts, you know, revenues beyond top level, you know, you can't talk supplier terms, you know, there's a lot of things that obviously they would be completely inappropriate for us to talk about. But what we can do is we can share tips and advice we can share news if policies are changing, share knowledge about a range of topics, lots of heads up, have you seen this? And that, you know, you don't need formal meetings for that, you just need an email or a WhatsApp. And those, you know, those kinds of connections um, allow, for this, allow, allow for this sharing. Um, somebody may be going into a new supplier relationship, well, what are the things they have to look out for? Um, they may be restructuring a department. Well, how does their, their, you know, that department work? What's your pay you know, um, uh, structure looking like? Not, no details of pay, of course. That, again, inappropriate. Um, uh, we set up some of the, so, the, um, the, so obviously we've just heard um, fantastic stuff from, from the Even Up group. That was one of the things that came out of these kinds of collaborations. We're gonna hear uh, from, Emma on open up and another one and and and, and I think the, the joint projects that have come out out of what just started off as some informal discussions about um, you know how can we best run our business um, how, uh, have been amazing there's also joint presentations so um, like at Charleston or UKSG I think there's been recently um, a joint presentation with uh, um, Missing Link in Germany, you know, where presses are coming together, where the power of the collective is, is greater than the, the, you know, obviously what we could do I you know, individually. Um, there's buddying schemes that we set, you know, we've set up, again, um, some, you know, often, in, often informal and formal, and I suppose that buddying or that mentoring or that peer-to-peer -peer mentoring is just, for me, incredibly important. I mean, there are several people around the room and they know who they are, who I speak to regularly. I couldn't imagine not having that community of people I talk to because they tell me whether I'm bonkers or whether <laughs> what we're trying to do is, is, is the right thing. But, that, um, but just that ability to share and share in a safe environment with people who are knowledgeable, this is all obvious stuff. But I suppose I just want to encourage people to, to do that, to reach out, to feel safe to do that, um, and to, yeah, to, to you know, really, it, make, it can make such a difference. Um, the other thing I just, you know, is just that um, in terms of collaboration, we collaborate across presses, but obviously we also have in, uh, organizations that help us. So, AUP has been fantastic in supporting a lot of things we do. Alps, IPG, you know, there are, there are definitely 
um, huge um, uh, wins when, when other organisations can come and, and ensure that our collaborations and our, um, you know, our coming together um, can be formalised, actually, and, and supported. So I'm going to shut up. You're going to hear much more interesting things from people who are going to, <laughs> going to talk about, um, about some of the, you know, the detailed collaborations that we've done. But so it is just from me to you, collaborate. It's worth it. And it has made us uh, the business that we are today. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Emma. I'm the editorial director at Manchester University Press, and I'm part of the editorial director's uh, cross-press group from the kind of the mid-size five plus a bit, I would call <laughs> us. Um, so for many years, that group was Manchester, Liverpool, Wales, Bristol, um, and Edinburgh, and UCL, and recently we've expanded to include University of London Press, which is great. Um, Going back in time a little bit, in 2021, uh, sometime in the summer, I was talking to my good friend Helen Dobson, who's at JISC, who used to be at the University of Manchester, which is why we're good friends. Um, and we were chatting about the open access community framework project that she was putting together for JISC. The idea of that framework was to invite publishers of all kinds to put forward diamond open access initiatives uh, that JISC would go on to promote to institutional libraries. We'd been thinking among the editorial directors group for a while about what we could do in terms of a collaboration sort of that would be visible to the wider world and that would do some good in the world. Um, and this GIST project looked uniquely effective as a way of putting an offering in front of UK universities. What we came up with was the Open Up project. You can have a slide. Oh, yeah, there it is. Um, well, the aim was to fund 12 OA books per year, so two per publisher, for three years, so 36 books in total. Um, they were all to be from UK-based early career researchers, and the aim of that was obviously to address inequalities in the kind of the funding landscape for people who might have precarious employment situations, who had less access to funding um, and just less likely to be able to afford sort of a, a BPC for their book. So the idea was that it would be on this Diamond OA sort of subscription model, um, and the books would all be drawn from our existing pipelines, because as we all know, it can take anything from about two to five years to get from the idea, you know, the book proposal through to a book actually appearing. So for practical reasons, it had to be done that way. This comes back in later on because it would be a bit of a stumbling block. Um, so what happened? The uptake in the end was about a third of what we hoped for. So it's ended up being 14 books overall. JISC have since mentioned, uh, the, it was mentioned definitely the Liverpool opening the monograph event a couple of weeks ago, uh, the slowness of libraries to participate in Diamond OA initiatives more generally. So we're not actually too disappointed with that outcome. We think kind of on balance that was pretty good. We found, though, that the ECR message was stronger than the Diamond OA message, and we had quite a few queries about how ECRs from specific institutions could apply to put their books into the Open Up programme, which obviously wasn't how it was going to work. But we were pleased that the overall idea and the overall kind of mission of the project seemed to be pretty appealing. So that was the project itself and its outcomes. Um, so what, what do we learn about collaboration? And I should say now that I have run this set of outcomes by my co-collaborators just to make sure that everybody agrees with me. We're broadly on the same page. Um, so if you're going to lead any collab kind of collaboration, um, just personally, I'd advise you not to get breast cancer and take four months off work, because that's what I immediately did. Um, so if you're going to do that, then please have an excellent team to rely on. I'd like to highlight uh, Tom Dark, now the editorial director at Edinburgh University Press, who at the time was a senior commissioning editor at Manchester and who stepped in with the support of our CEO Simon Ross just to kind of help take the nascent idea forward. Um, so yeah, it might, have, it might have fallen down without that. On the library side, JISC takes the administrative pain away, obviously. Many, many libraries, one organisation in the middle. Uh, they were truly an enabling force here. Ali mentioned that there are organisations that kind of allow us to collaborate more effectively, and JISC is definitely one of those. So our heroes in this were Helen Dobson, Ben Taplin on the licensing side, and Caroline Mackay, so available to us in terms of the queries that we had um, and kind of doing something that was new to us all. So thank you very much, those of you who are in the room. On the publishing side, we don't have that enabling force. So there had to be volunteers to take the admin pain. 
Six publishers doesn't sound like very many, but someone has to invoice JISC and then raise purchase orders so that the other publishers um, can invoice and then make payments. Someone has to keep all of the many complicated application documents in order and tr all the tracking information and the JISC banding and the correspondence in the accessible online folders um, and keep all of that kind of clear and meeting deadlines. Um, someone has to organize all of the meetings, make sure the deadlines are met and that all the queries are handled. Someone has to field all the, the, the queries from librarians that come in via JISC or directly in some cases because we were obviously visible as the people running this, um, this operation. Someone has to provide reports back to JISC on what we've published and when because that's part of the deal. So the very dullest parts of this landed on my desk because it was all my fault to begin with. Um, but we had some great work in the team from Ali Wellesby at Liverpool in uh, fielding librarian queries in particular, Tom Dark at Edinburgh, um, who has taken the lead in reporting back to JISC, mainly because the first two books have been Edinburgh's um, because of the, the way that the scheduling's worked. The main plus of the whole thing was having lots of clever brains to apply to the ideas and the problem solving part of things. So there were many perceptive questions about formats, um, kind of comparative BPC levels between presses, pricing structures, and, and how this would work as a kind of large operation. Um, so we, we really did think things through and we really did learn from one another. For example, there was great input from Victoria at Bristol and, and her colleagues about criteria for author eligibility, which had to be thought through. Uh, the JISC application form was not meant for multiple publishers applying together for any kind of scheme whatsoever. Um, so navigating that was much easier with help from the JISC side, but also um, Lara at uh, UCL Press was very helpful in that one in particular. And Sarah Lewis at University of Wales Press, who can't be here today, uh, is incredibly good at titles and came up with Open Up. So full credit to her for that. Um, <laughs> on, the other, on the other hand, uh, we did forget at one point that we were humble editorial directors. Um, so we got everything up and running and then realised that we also could have done with a bit of buy-in and collaboration from a cross-publisher group of heads of marketing, or at least marketing somebody, um, and that was quite late in the day. So what, what we actually found was we should have thought about who could have put together a single landing page for the, the, the cross-publisher initiative. Um, so we ended up with pages on our own websites. So that was six different places you could find the information. And one page for all of us would have looked a lot more collaborative had we thought of that up front. And we also should have thought about who would manage the sort of social and general media comms about it, because in the end, some of us were shouting a little bit more loudly than others. So we kind of learned that we, we can't just do it all ourselves. And we know that within our own presses. So why, why we thought we could without, you know, is, is, a, is, a, is an interesting question. Um, and because this is a collaboration, I'm going to tell you some of the things that my colleagues came back with. They don't know that I'm going to do this. Um, so Tom Dark mentioned that collaboration crucially means having others to rely on. Being able to step in and put another book forward when one pulled out is much easier across multiple publishers than relying on a single list. Uh, it taught us even more about our shared challenges from keeping track of data on which authors in our systems are early career researchers, which was actually more tricky than it sounds, uh, to keeping publishing schedules on track, to gathering OA usage statistics, which as we all know, it can be a nightmare, <laughs> uh, in order to report back to the funders. Um, from Victoria at BUP, um, she mentioned that by collaborating on this and the way in which we support each other more generally, we demonstrate that supporting the academic community and fulfilling our missions as university presses is more important than any element of competition there might be between us. Uh, and Ali Wellsby called it something we would all do again, but with lessons learned that we probably needed to have a central figure to do most of this, especially the marketing side, or maybe a matrix of responsibilities. That's Ali Wellsby at Liverpool University Press, I should say. So it was good to do something constructive and outward looking as a group, to cement our identity more externally as the mid-sized university press is. I'm not totally sure how much traction that gained, given that we still seem to be a little bit invisible in the talk about the future of OA monographs at the event a couple of weeks ago, which all seems to centre around either OUP and CUP or the much newer, smaller presses. Having said that, though, having worked together once, we're now turning to one another to formulate collective responses to things like rights of attention policies and the UKRI ref consultation, because our interests are aligned and our voices are louder if we all shout together.
Um, so I'm Philippa Grand. Um, I'm at LSE Press, but I've only been there for three weeks. So I was previously at University of Westminster Press. Um, so working in the open institutional publisher world for several years now. Um, so I'm going to be talking about collaboration amongst open institutional publishers uh, in the UK and particularly talk about the setting up of a new group, the Open Institutional Publishing Association, or OIPA, um, which was set up to help facilitate collaboration between members and find ways that we might work together in future. Um, so this just outlines, this slide outlines what I'm going to cover, so a look at OIPA but also at how central the concepts of collaboration, community and mutual aid have become to the non-profit OA sector, of which OIPA is part, uh, in general. So firstly... Oh, there we go. Is it going to do something weird? No. Um, how are we defining open institutional publishers? So this group comprises of the new university presses, library publishers, or those working on open journal services within universities or research institutions. But we've purposefully been very inclusive in our definition. So it would also include any publishing activity, no matter how small scale. So someone running a single journal within a department, for example, uh, or those not yet involved in publishing but keen to explore their options. Um, these presses and publishing activities can be very different, so different business models, different relationships to their home institution, uh, different sizes, um, but what we have in common is um, open access as a unifying theme, that we are non-profits and see ourselves, like the established university presses, like the Mid-Size Five, as mission-driven and embedded in the academic community. And there's also um, a bit of an activist slant, I would say, to what we're doing. So we're purposefully positioning ourselves as an alternative to um, large-scale commercial publishing and wanting to see change in scholarly communications. So in 2022, a group of these open institutional publishers, um, along with Graham Stone from JISC, started to meet in an informal way online in a semi -regular, on a semi-regular basis. And it soon became clear that we were facing very similar challenges, challenges that we felt were quite unique within publishing, and we could clearly see the value in finding ways to come together that were more formalised. And the result of these discussions was the setting up of OIPA, uh, we had a soft launch at UKSG last year, and we used Open Access Week for a more formal launch of our website and branding too. And we now have 18 members, um, and JISC is an associate member. So what were these challenges that we felt we faced? Uh, well, most of us um, are very small-scale operations, um, many being run by just one or two people. We're often working to um, very tight budgets. We're working within institutions um, who are new to directly managing or running publishing functions. There can be confusion from academics about the type of publisher we are. Are we just in-house vanity publishers? And I think this sense of wariness is then amplified by myths that proliferate uh, about open access publishing too. These presses can suffer from a lack of visibility within their own institutions um, and across um, academia more broadly. And we're also aware, especially in a context of evolving policy around OA, of the low levels of power and influence that we had as individual entities. So it's clear that working together would be vital not only to provide support to the individuals working in this sector, but also to help this sector uh, grow and thrive. So by coming together, we felt we could share resources, experiences um, and best practice, foster support and networking opportunities across the community, build partnerships with others in the wider OA and scholarly comms world, provide a collective voice in sector discussions, raise the visibility of this type of publishing with various stakeholders and advocate for the expertise and the value of institutional open access publishing too. So what have we achieved so far? <clears throat> well, we've worked on governance um, and we have formed an interim committee listed here. 
Um, with funding secured by one of our members, uh, we designed our branding um, and we've set up uh, uh, an OIPA website um, and we also have a presence on social media. We set up a mailing list and a team site, and the team site is a huge piece of work in its own right, uh, across institutional team sites. Uh, we've hosted, uh, co-hosted webinars and presented on OIPA at various events. We've set up two working groups, um, one on advocacy and one on skills. Uh, we've been engaging with UKRI and Research England um, on behalf of our members on new OA books policies. We also applied for and received an innovation award from UKSG um, and are using those funds to host an in-person symposium in June. Um, and there's lots more in the pipeline too. So in developing these horizontal alliances between presses and services, we're following other similar non-profit open access groups, such as the scholar-led group or the Library Publishing Coalition in the US, in realising the importance and value of joining forces. And for Yana Kiradima and Sam Moore in their 2021 paper, Scaling Small, or How to Envision New Relationalities for Knowledge Production, they see such alliances as not just nice to have, but as fundamental to ensuring the robustness and resilience of the non-profit OA publishing sector. And these new relationalities characterise institutional publishing in other ways too, um, not just between the presses themselves. So, for example, two of OIPA's member presses work as cross-institutional collaborations. Uh, so Scottish Universities Press is a collaboration between 19 academic libraries across Scotland. And White Rose University Press is jointly run by Leeds, Sheffield and York Universities. OIPA members um, are also developing new types of relationships with libraries as they take part in um, library funding schemes, such as JISC's Open Access Community Framework, uh, or um, working with the Open Book Collective. And it's early days in how this relationship between libraries and publishers um, will develop, but this is clearly a different kind of interaction to a traditional transactional model. And being embedded in a library, as we are at LSE Press and as um, other presses like Edinburgh Diamond are, is another example of these new relationalities within the sector too. So Adima and Moore um, describe what they see as a new organisational philosophy that is emerging amongst non-profit OA publishers. And they frame that in direct contrast to the approach of large commercial publishers. They characterise this philosophy of one, as one of mutual reliance and interdependence rather than separation and competition. Uh, similarly, a 2017 report to JISC on non-profit OA publishing describes an ethos of collaboration and gifting in stark opposition to the closed off and proprietary business and publishing models of commercial publishers. And in the wider OA, um, the wider non-profit OA world, the Open Book Collective's mission statement is even more explicit in this oppositional framing, talking of collaboration and resource sharing over competition, network community building over profit-driven centralization, horizontal working relationships over exclusive hierarchization. And in fact, the Open Book Collective see collaboration as so important that part of their application process includes a, summary, uh, a question on community engagement. So they're asking potential members how they are sharing knowledge and expertise as a form of mutual support. All of this um, is to say that for OIPA, I thought I had a final slide, but I don't. Um, all of this is to say that for OIPA, horizontal collaboration with other presses and publishing services has some very practical applications and will be vital um, for ensuring our long-term sustainability and resilience. But more than that, the new relationalities that characterise the non-profit OA publishing sector is really part of our ethos and mission, fundamental to providing alternative models of publishing and central to our attempts to do things differently and bring about change. Um, the quote that I've used um, as the title of my presentation, It Matters What Stories Make Worlds, What Worlds Make Stories, um, is a quote from Donna Haraway. Um, and it reminds us, as I think um, it is important for, the, um, for us in the nonprofit world to, to remember, that while what we publish matters, how we publish, the type of publishing organisations that we create, the worlds that we make matters just as much too. And the communities we build 
and relationships we forge, collaboration, is at the heart of this for OIPA and the wider non-profit OA world. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you very much to the panel. That was that was terrific. Um, are there any questions? Right, it's the gentleman at the in the middle at the back there. Thank you. Thank you for that very thought-provoking panel. Uh, my name is Charles Watkinson. I'm from University of Michigan Press. I, um, uh, so we're, we're very, as publishers, we're very integrated and um, you know, woven into uh, relationships with commercial publishers and commercial platforms, for example. Um, many of us sort of you know, migrate through our careers and maybe we'll work for a commercial publisher at some stage and then go into university press publishing. And many of our uh, uh, you know, uh, we rely on commercial infrastructure a lot of the time. So I wanted to ask, um, in this network of trust, where's the boundary between a university press or an open institutional entity and a commercial entity? Is that a fluid boundary or is that a hard boundary? And how do you accommodate the diversity of different publishing um, models you know, in, in your relationships, in your, uh, your relationship of trust and mutual sharing in an environment where you're so enmeshed in commercial relationships? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Easy question, then. <laughs> um, I don't think there are hard boundaries in, in the sense of, you know, that we um, sit within a prescribed box. Um, I think... In our collaborations, we are just, we are, well, it's interesting, Bristol sort of sits, you know, we're certainly not, we're certainly not um, a press like Philippa's, but we are not-for-profit, and actually, you know, we, we um, yeah, so, uh, and we sit within an institution, and we're, we're very much part of that institution. Um, but we work all the time with other commercial presses and we have to cover our costs and we are commercial in nature. You know, we still have to find the money to invest in the development. We talk at Bristol all the time of having three underlying, uh, people always have their pillars, don't they? We have our pillars, we have three, which is a bit unbalanced, but you know, hey. Um, so we talk about um, uh, our contribution to academic scholarship and thought leadership. We talk about financial sustainability or you know, uh, fiscal sustainability, as Christy mentioned earlier, and we talk about our social mission. And actually, we're always balancing those three things. For, um, and, but that we can't do, though we, unless we're financially sustainable, we can't do those other two things. It, that's where it falls down. We've been in a period of massive growth, which we're very grateful for, but that was only through funding from our own institution in order to allow us to make that, that, that step change. That, that funding's coming to an end now. But the, the point is, is that we, I suppose what I'm trying to say is balancing that commercial reality. We are competitors. You know, we, we can't say we're not competitors with other, with other, with other university presses and other commercial presses. Um, but, uh, so we're very aware of that. However, I don't think it completely closes down collaboration in any shape or form. I, th I think when I'm talking about collaboration, I was really, there's such an element of mutual support, and that's what, that's what I've flourished on, is being able to talk to other people about similar issues and problems and come together to think through uh, think through how to how to approach that. So that's probably quite a waffly answer, but <laughs> maybe because it's quite a hard, you know, question to answer. Do you want to add anything? Well, firstly, Charles, I think you'd have a brilliant answer to this, so yeah. I'd like yeah, to hear yeah. your answer at some <laughs> exactly. point. Um, I don't. I suppose what I'm thinking about is, you know, on this on the open institutional world. I suppose there's much more of a activism kind of way of thinking you know and and there's but there's a you know 
there are very degrees of activism on that scale, you know, how, I think it might be a question for OIPA to think about, you know, how activist, how purist are we? Are we going full radical OA group or, you know, where are we on that scale versus some pragmatic issues? Because no doubt, you know, we have these very distinct um, challenges around budgets but we're also, you know, but we're also embedded within libraries who also have very firm views about, um, you know, the commercials working with, you know, commercial partners. So I think that might be something that OIPA needs to think about at some point. And maybe, you know, we also need to think about we're sitting within institutions too. How radical will, are they happy with us being? You know, I, I don't kind of, I don't really know the answer to that. Maybe individual presses within OIPA will be able to be more radical. I don't know how collectively we feel about activism and radicalism. What I do think is that it seems to be an interesting conversation emerging around activism, which Caroline Edwards talks about, Sarah Kemba talks about bringing politics back into publishing. So I think that's, that, that's an interesting way to start thinking about it. I don't know if any other OIPA committee members here have thoughts that I can make them answer this instead. <laughs> any, any other <coughs> questions? Oh, right at the back there, yeah. Hi, thanks uh, also from me for the talk on you've just given. Uh, Tim Colbrook from Ubiquity Press. You talked a bit about collaboration, particularly in terms of uh, book publishing. I wonder if you have any thoughts on collaboration on journals and sort of publishing through there, um, whether it's more difficult, whether it's something where you see more possibilities to work on. Um, and I guess also touching upon publishing agreements and the sort of difficulties with that. Um, for journals, obviously, if you're not with a, a larger publisher, then obviously publishing agreements are more difficult to engage with. Um, so whether there's room, whether you see it as a sort of uh, a positive or a negative in terms of the future for journals in university presses. Um, well, I could, I could get to go. I mean, I, so I think, so we have a great collaboration uh, on journals, but I have to, with another university press, but I have to say it's nothing to do with the intellectual content. It's with, it's with Liverpool, who uh, came to our rescue when Turpin, our distributors and subscription agents, uh, completely collapsed. And we wouldn't have a journals programme if it wasn't for Liverpool stepping in and actually, um, and thanks to Anthony and his team, because honestly we would, we would have been, you know, we would have lost an awful lot of money. So those kind of collaborations, I think, build on the kind of collaborations that I was talking about to start with, you know, actually. It was incredibly helpful uh, in that set score. I think... Um, I think it would be quite difficult to do some of the... Um, uh, collaborations uh, with uh, publishing licensing agreement for journals. I don't know. We don't have any. We have collaborations like many with associations, but not with other publishers. Um, I, I, you know, I think we would just have to think about that. Uh, is Julia in the room? <coughs> no. I was just wondering if our journals director was in the room because she might be able to answer answer better than I. But um, yeah, I think that that might be trickier. Uh, on the in the non kind of wider non profit OA publishing world, I'd say Open Library of Humanities are really doing interesting things with journals and especially how they're resetting the relationship between the publisher and the author. Uh, you know, and uh, they've been um, I think they call it flipping journals, so taking journals from that have been with large commercial organisations and turning them into diamond open access journals. Again, I don't know if Caroline's here. She'll be able to talk about this much better than me. Um, and then uh, re really resetting that relationship between authors and journals, which I think is so exciting. Kind of putting hand, you know, truly community-led and putting 
the power back in the hands of the authors, really. Thanks, everybody. Bernie from Araspa. Um, I'm feeling really inspired by all of the things today, so thanks very much for that. Um, I want, following on from Open Library of Humanities that you just mentioned, Philippa, I wanted to just quickly share a little story that people may not know, and um, it's, it ties into this theme of talking to each other and collaborating and learning. So, and Caroline is going to be here tomorrow, I think. She's definitely going to be here tomorrow. Um, so Martin Eve, I believe, started the Open Library of, Library of Humanities a long time ago. But I'm going back a long time before that. So when I worked at SAGE, I convened a group of people, librarians and researchers, to talk about social science and humanities and how what barriers there were in the way of, of that research doing the work it needed to in, in, you know, for real world impact, that kind of stuff. And Martin was there and he was an academic, he was, I guess he was doing his PhD, I don't know, maybe it was before that, at the time. And I was really struck by him and if anyone's met Martin they'll know he's a striking character. But he was this, he was a researcher, he was an academic, but he was passionate about understanding the publishing, the money flows the ecosystem, and, it, and he was un, all the other researchers didn't know anything about how the mon, where the money flows were. He was really angry, actually, and passionate. And the reason I'm mentioning that is earlier on today we talked about how do we get authors, researchers, passionate and interested in in where they publish and why they should publish their work openly, and 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 how that might impact to have much more impact perhaps than publishers speaking about this. So. I just wanted to make that connection because it re look what he did with that pa passion, and it is they are an incredible publisher. But they this activism idea is very much behind it, and and having that courage, I suppose, to put your ideas into practice. Yeah, we were just talking about this question over lunch. Actually, how do we? How you know? It's a perennial question. Isn't it? How do we get authors to be interested? I mean, maybe we just never are. Maybe the you know they've got a lot of other things to worry about. And I think one of the challenges is. Um, you know, you don't want to make, I think, you know, they really, they don't, they switch off as soon as you start talking about the complications of OA or the cleverness of your model or you know, all those kinds of things. So how do we make it easy, as easy for them as it is to publish in any other way? And then they're not having to get involved in the nitty gritty of, oh, cost this if you do this, or, you know, this is our fee if you're based here, it's too you know. Hard. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's boring. They just, they, you know, I could count probably on one hand in a 20 year career how many academics I've met who are actually really interested in publishing, which maybe we just have to accept that they're not find other ways. You know, maybe it's um, getting other, maybe it's using other academics to talk about their experiences. You know, maybe, maybe it's not, maybe we have to move kind of beyond open access being the exciting shiny thing and there are other, other parts of this that are, that might appeal to them. So, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Mm. Yeah. <coughs> then one. Then Kim. Hi, I'm <laughs> Alison Levy, director of Brown University Digital Publications. Uh, thank you. This is a great panel. Um, I'm all for collaboration as well. Um, just to, in sum, uh, say what we do at Brown. We're not a press. Uh, we think of ourselves more as producers rather than publishers because we, um, we, we develop born digital enhanced monographs, but we rely on um, publishing partners to bring the work out. Uh, and so I, I guess I have so many questions, mainly for Philippa, but interested to hear from all of you what this alternative publishing model can mean for um, content in terms of new scholarly forms, how it's developed, how it's presented, how it's shared out. So thinking about um, authors and readers and just the, all of the, the opportunities there. I'll just cite one collaboration that we're involved with because Charles is right behind me with the University of Michigan Press. Um, we are working with authors from 
HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, uh, where they don't have this infrastructure at their home institution, but we're working with them um, to develop their work uh, as OA uh, digital, digital publications. But part of that also involves training, training of librarians at their institutions so that there's some infrastructure that's being built up. So that also ties in the activism piece. But um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, again, just what's possible in terms of um, alternative, even, even how we define content scholarly content. Yeah, I think there's lots of really exciting um, work going on here. And University of London Press uh, have partnered with, I know they've partnered with um, Manifold. So they're absolutely looking at different um, you know, approaches to publishing, different ways of publishing multimedia content. Um, and uh, was it the Open Book Futures here ran a um, a call at the beginning of this year for experimental publishing projects. And while I was at UWP, um, we were successful in that call and won funding for um, uh, one of these experimental publishing projects that will, that, it's called Deep, Deep Maps, Blue Humanities, it will do something very clever using, working with um, one of the JSTOR platforms. <laughs> it's, uh, I recently left Westminster, so I can't remember all the details. But I think there's huge potential. I mean, if you're kind of removing the profit motive, then you, you know, partly you are opening up yourself to all sorts of other ways of doing things and ways of being. Um, so, yeah, I think that's particularly exciting for these, the oiper presses. Yeah, and I'd love to hear what you're doing. <laughs> <coughs> okay, then was so there was oh okay. So um, Thea Andrew from representing Edward and Diamond, one of the OIPA members, and it's just a follow-on um, to the last question. When you're non-profit, you can afford to be experimental in what you can offer. So we have been working with a number of our academics on experimental journals, and one of these is the British Guide to Pharmacology database citation. So they've got a database and their academics were like, well, how do we get kudos for populating a database? So we created um, a jour light journal that forms a basis that can you can cite a database. So we've developed an automated workflow where it pulls data directly from the database itself, turns it into a journal article, so it has a for, uh, citation, so people can make citations for a database. And that's just, you know, you couldn't really do that uh, if you're profit-seeking, so it's kind of experimental. Other things we're doing now are with practice-based researchers. Um, so working with the Edinburgh College of Art, we're publishing a number of portfolios from their previous REF submission. Um, and these portfolios are from uh, musicians who have created music scores, and they go into the... Uh, they create a rich story of you know their scholarship and their, their research. Um, and it's not possible, because it doesn't... You can't shoehorn this into other forms of uh, literature. You can't squeeze it into a book, really. You can't squeeze it into a journal article. So we're able to work with, directly with academics to create portfolios for practice-based research. It's like a new form. Um, and so it's really, you know, really exciting. The, there's a lot of possibilities, and we're just beginning that process of, kind of understanding what the limits are. And you know, we, we can really you know, push boundaries. And it's, it's really exciting to be part of this. Thank you. Right. Well, my clock is telling me that it's 4.01, so I think this means we have to wrap up. So I'd like to thank my terrific panel for their wonderful presentations and uh, hope you will join me in thanking them too.